Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I feel a considerable sadness on this occasion for one reason. I have been reading the <clears throat> writings of the Blakeleys for a number of years, and they are what uh, I think they would identify as in the Christian church. And their writings with reference to fundamental and basic matters are vital and right down the line. Uh, some of the finest uh, teaching on the plan of salvation, the identity of the church, the necessity of Christian living, all of these matters they teach with as great an emphasis as I would. They are not in what I would call the main line of the Christian church. They seem to have little or no relationship with that group. They are committed totally to the identity of the church and the plan of salvation, and they preach it and teach it with effectiveness and power. It therefore grieves me to see a man who is so obviously sincere as he is, and yet so confused and bewildered with reference to many of these matters as indicated in the speech which we have just heard. For him, I have the greatest respect, and I shall do my best to uh, set out what I believe to be the truth regarding these matters, and you will decide, based upon your conclusions uh, drawn from the premises advanced, which one of us is in harmony with the teaching of God's Word. Now, just a few things with reference to his speech, though there's not a great deal in it, that necessitates much reply from me. He says he's glad that there's no issue over the matter of indwelling. Well, did he think there ever was? It's a strange thing to me that there are those who, and I'm, I'm saying that he's not in the category, but there are those who simply deliberately misrepresent our position on this. Because we teach that the Spirit operates by the Word, there are those who say, well, you don't believe in the Spirit's operation at all, which is a false statement. There are those who say, because you teach that the Spirit uses medium in his influence upon people, that you therefore teach a spiritless doctrine. That's false too. There are those who say, while you relegate the Holy Spirit to the realm of comparative unimportance and charge that his work is not involved in the plan of salvation at all, that's false too. Let me emphasize the statement made it is our confirmed conviction that the Holy Spirit inaugurates, carries through, and consummates every case of conversion and of sanctification in the world. And it's done today exactly like it was in the apostolic age, as we'll get to when we deal with his question. Now, he calls attention to the fact that in 2 Corinthians 6, it is said, God said, I will dwell in them. No question about it. We emphasize the fact that God is in us, Christ is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how. We agree that God doesn't dwell in us literally and actually and bodily. We agree that Christ doesn't dwell in us literally, actually and bodily. But the same kind of statement, exactly the same, that says that God is in us and Christ is in us also says that the Holy Spirit is in us. Well, if the statement that God is in us doesn't mean he is literally in us, then why should he conclude in the absence of, that, of testimony that when it says the Spirit is in us, that therefore he's literally in us? He's in us, yes, in the same sense the Father and the Son are, and in no other. And it's strange that he cannot see that. He said that the Bible doesn't anywhere say that, the, whole, that father, the Father and the Son dwell in us representatively. But he believes that. In a recent issue of the Banner of the Truth, that is positively and clearly affirmed. He said the book doesn't say that the Spirit dwells in us through the Word. It doesn't say it dwells in us literally and actually and bodily either. That's the issue here tonight. It's a question of what does the book say. And that, my friends, is what we shall keep before you. He points out the fact that we're joined to the Lord with the Spirit. Indeed we are. How? How do we become attached to the Lord? By the teaching of the Spirit. Listen, Romans 8 and 14. As many as are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Now one might conclude that that means that one is led to become a child of God by the Holy Spirit. And that's certainly true. But the context in which this statement appears, Romans 8, is dealing with the child of God. 
So what's there said is that the child of God is led to live as such by the Spirit. But get it now, the, all, the only information that you or I have about how to live the Christian life, much less the Christian life itself, is what I find and what you find in the New Testament. But when you follow that teaching, Paul said that you're being led by the Spirit. Well, why? Because the Spirit gave that teaching. When you follow that teaching, you're following the leading of the Spirit. When you reject that teaching, you're rejecting the leading of the Spirit because that's the teaching that the Spirit gave. That's the way the Spirit leads. That's the only way the Spirit leads. That's what the book teaches, and that's what our brethren, for the most part, believe in years past. When I was a young preacher, if someone among us had even hinted at the idea that he believed that the Holy Spirit dwelt in one literally, bodily, and apart from the Word, and was essential to the proper understanding of the text, he would have been rejected as a false teacher. These were the views that we debated with denominational people. And unfortunately, there are those among us today who have espoused those views and are now teaching what we used to refute in debate with denominational preachers. Now get this, friends. There are two reasons for it. One, too many are drinking from the wells of denominational theology rather than the New Testament. Secondly, there's been an erosion of thinking in recent years with reference to the personality of the Spirit. As long as one concludes, and properly so, that the Spirit is a distinct person, then he'll have little difficulty with this subject. It's only when he loses sight of that and begins to argue that the Spirit is some sort of an influence operating in addition to the Word of God that he falls into grievous error. Now, he calls our attention to 2 Peter 1 and 3. He hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Well, if he has, then we do not need today an additional influence. Doesn't he see that this is directly and diametrically opposed to his position? 2,000 years ago, Peter said that he hath given to us all things. Now, that's not some things, but all things. That pertain to what? Just to life but not godliness? No, that pertain to what? Life and godliness. All things pertain to both. But what did he mean by that? That he had supplied us with the means by which to reach it. This man thinks that this is not correct. At least that you can't reach it by means of the revelation given, that it takes an additional influence. And then amazingly, he says that 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, completely furnished to every good work. But this is a reference to the Old Testament and hence implies that it's not pertinent to this discussion. Well, there are a number of interesting things about that. If that is correct, then it follows that those people in the Old Testament period that used the Old Testament, they did not have, by his own admission, as he'll argue based upon uh, John 7, 39, that the Holy Spirit had not been given, which he thinks has reference to an indwelling, at least in his writings is so indicated. Now, get this. He thinks that those people in the Old Testament could understand the Old Testament without a direct operation of the Spirit, or at least an indwelling of it but that those of us who have the Christian scriptures, that is the New Testament, that we can't understand it without the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Can it be possible that this man believes that? I don't think so. And yet, this is a logical conclusion that he draws. He cites us to uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which simply confirms the position that I'm affirming tonight. That is, that the Word of God is quick and powerful. Quick and powerful. Only limited in its operation? No. Quick and powerful as a two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And yet he thinks there must be an additional influence wrought in order for us to be able to appreciate and understand that word. That, friends, is Calvinism. That man is incapable of understanding the Word of God without a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. I hope, for the sake of his soul and the good that he could otherwise do, that he will repudiate in that false position. Now then, with reference to his questions, I'll get to them very quickly, and I will 
I learned a long time ago in debating that you can judge of a person's sincerity and a love of truth by the way that responds to questions. If a person really wants to uh, have the truth, he'll deal clearly and unhesitatingly and without evasion a question submitted. And I hope that in this debate that this will be true of us both. Number one, what became of the Holy Spirit after the apostolic age? Well, where he's always been. He works today just like he did then. His manifestations are not always the same. Back in that day, um, some manifestations were uh, by virtue of miraculous power. But now get this, friends. The operation of the Spirit in the apostolic age was for one purpose. That was to get the gospel to people. In the absence of a written word, it was necessary for it to be miraculously done. All, uh, uh, back in that day, inspiration was in men. In the nature of the case, while in men, they had to be miraculously endowed. Take the tongues, for example. Suppose that those early preachers had been required to attend language school and study the various languages of the earth before they could begin to preach. Multitudes of people would have died without a knowledge of salvation. So the Holy Spirit simply miraculously endowed them. This is what's meant by the tongues of the Bible. But eventually, inspiration was transferred from men to a book. Just as soon as the transfer was made, that book then became the message that had been given by inspired men previously. And just as it was totally adequate to meet all the demands of the case when, it was given, when the message was given through the gospel, and it's the gospel by which men are saved, Romans 1, 16, 17, and not by direct operation of the Spirit, when that transfer was made to the book, then it was the gospel. John 20, 30, and 31, many other signs. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Does that sound like you would need some additional influence in order to enable you to understand? In Romans 10 and 17, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Paul said in Romans 5 and 1, we're justified by faith. That teaches us then that justification, salvation, and I would add sanctification, is maintained by that same faith of the gospel. Number two are the bodies of baptized believers, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now here again, there is an implication that somebody is denying that the Bible teaches an indwelling. Nobody denies that. In a similar passage found in uh, the last verses of the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul said that ye are a temple of God. A temple of God. I ask you, Ms., uh, Brother Blakely, does that mean that God was literally in them? If it doesn't, then why do you deny that temple of God means a literal indwelling of God and then affirm that a temple of Christ or the Holy Spirit means an indwelling of the Spirit? Now why, why answer that when you get up? Tell us the difference. You say when it says that God is a temple, uh, that God is our temple, and that our body is a temple of God, and God is in us, but that doesn't mean he's literally in us, then why is it that when the book says that uh, the Spirit is in us, and that our body is a temple of the Spirit, that therefore he's in us literally? Now you can see, of course, the problem that he's faced. Are you in the flesh or in the Spirit? In the Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But you're not in the flesh... Uh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwell in you, of course he dwells in us. But how? Through the teaching which he gave. What did he say about my argument on the incarnation? Not anything, but he must deal with that because we'll insist on it as we go along. Pre number four, precisely, what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit today? Same as it was in the apostolic age, to get the gospel to people. Exactly the same. And it's still operating just as it did then. Not one particle of difference. It was to enable people to know what the plan of salvation is by teaching the word. It still does that just as it did then, except that the inspiration was transferred from men to a book. Number five, can the Holy Spirit be effectively given without being received? Well, depends entirely there upon what you mean by being given. If you're talking about that there's some sort of a bestowal of the Holy Spirit, 
uh, in the literal sense, then your question is um, not apropos to this discussion. I do not know what you mean, but given. You'll have to explain that. When you ask here about uh, him being received, it's significant that in every instance, every instance, and we shall prove this, where the word received is with reference to the Holy Spirit, it was a miraculous reception. Every one of them. I, I ask now that you challenge me on that and require me to prove that because that's what I'm going, going to do. Now then, back to my affirmative, since I have covered uh, his uh, speech. Let me see here. Well, maybe one other point or two here. He calls our attention to the fact that uh, uh, we, John says that we know, uh, that we might know that we have an unction for the Holy One and so on. Of course we know it. But how do we know it? Well, through the means or ministry of the Holy Spirit. But how did the Holy Spirit enable us to know it? By means of the teaching which he gave. Where is that teaching? It's in the New Testament as it relates to us tonight. How effective is it that the man of God may be complete? You get this, friends. If there are influences that are wrought upon us, in addition to and apart from that word, then that simply means the word is not enough. That it's incapable of accomplishing the salvation of man, that it takes this operation of the Spirit in order to achieve it. This is the denominational doctrine of the, of the direct operation of the Spirit transferred to the matter of the Christian. Now then, to further affirmation. I'm sorry that I can't put this on the board up here, but then our facilities are not such that we can, so I'll just present it to you uh, orally. That's a, a good way anyway. Now, two minutes. Quickly, here is what this is all about. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's a part of the Godhead. He is deity. He possesses a personality. In fact, he's a masculine personality. John 16, 13, how be it when he who is the Holy Spirit shall come, he shall guide you into all truth. He is a personality. Thirdly, he communicates by speaking, no other way, not by impact direct impact, not by hunches, not by intuition, not by so-called inner leadings, but his communication is by word. Second Samuel 23, 2, the Spirit spake by me, and his word was on my tongue. First Timothy 4 and 1, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Revelation 2 and 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, to the churches. That shows us that the Spirit is communicated. Communicated with the churches, we receive the message by receiving that communication. Interesting that statement is. Bear in mind that our Lord dictated uh, those letters. This follows seven times the letters to the churches of Asia Minor. That refrain is there after each one of them. Our Lord dictated those letters and John wrote them. Why is it then that in receiving them, we receive what the Spirit said? The answer, it was never. Get this now, never the function of the Holy Spirit to originate truth, it was his function to reveal truth. Can I prove that? I can and shall. In uh, John 16, 13, how be it when he who is the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you to all truth. Now listen, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. This to the apostles, and therefore the revelation made to them. Now the next question, through what medium was that revelation of the Spirit made? 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 13. Paul makes three points. One, it takes a revelation to know God. Two, that revelation was made in word. Three, it was made through the pens of inspired writers. Then the next point, where is that deposit of truth as it relates to us tonight? It's in the New Testament. Now then, finally, what, is, what may be said of its sufficiency? Does it meet our every need? That the man of God may be complete, completely furnished unto every good work. And so, friends, we've proved our proposition world without end. And regardless of what is, may be said, it stands out. The Spirit operates today. He operates on individuals, both with reference to conversion and to sanctification. He does so by means of the teaching which he gave. Quickly, note a parallel. Colossians chapter 2, chapter 3, and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled is there an imperative, a command. And not only that, but it's a present command. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. It's what it says. 
i thank you we have a parallel between the two will develop it f